Hi, everybody, and welcome to this, uh, another uh, exciting installment in our Rift Valley Network webinar series. Um, and uh, today we are lucky to have uh, newly minted Dr. Matthew Nisley here uh, to uh, talk to us. Uh, Matthew is uh, recently completed his PhD in anthropology with an emph emphasis in archaeology at the University of Chicago. He previously obtained an MA in social sciences at the University of Chicago and a BA with honors in anthropology from Washington University in St. Louis. His research focuses broadly on human environment relations ranging from the historical archaeology and anthropology of foragers to the Anthropocene. He's also interested in political ecology, landscape studies, temporality, and uh, ethnobot ethnobotany and archaeobotany. Now, I know him best through his work with the Sandawe people, which represents the first study of landscape occupation and food getting in the area. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Matthew uh, as he gives his talk, Food, Getting Repertoires and Ecological Infrastructures, Rethinking Foraging and Farming in Tanzania. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see uh, those of you again. I gave a presentation just over a year ago about uh, my archaeological work. And to give you a sense of uh, how recently I graduated, uh, I just noticed my title is wrong on the, <laughs> on, the, on the first slide of the presentation. I just graduated three weeks ago. And uh, I hope that that means that I'll be able to come to more uh, Rift Valley Network sessions and also just to speak with some of you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, <clears throat> some of you in the group, <clears throat> uh, and I apologize for this, uh, have noticed that especially over the last few years, I might randomly send an email and then disappear for a very long period of time. Uh, and I'm hoping that some of that will uh, no longer happen, but we'll see. Uh, I'm sticking around the University of Chicago. Uh, they have a new, uh, postdoc program, uh, and I have, a, I have one of those. So I'll be at Chicago for the next two years. So uh, as Andrew said, uh, my degree was, is in anthropology, and I, my dissertation was focused on uh, archaeology. But I had previously done ethnographic and ethnobotanical work in the Sandawe homeland, and uh, this is focusing on that work. And I'm actually finally many years later, uh, just about to send off an article uh, that talks about a lot of what you'll hear today. I originally did this research in 2005 and 2006, so it's almost historical anthropology itself at this point. And, um, but in the continued trips that I have made to the area, I uh, not only continued to talk to folks about uh, leafy vegetables, which are a lot of fun, uh, but about other aspects of wild plant and animal use in the region. So, oh, and one thing I wanted to say before I get started as well is that um, the my computer has some strange bug and the audio occasionally cuts out. So if at any point I go silent, feel free to cut in. Uh, it means that I'll need to leave the room and come back, but then the problem shouldn't happen again. So, so no worries if that happens. So, um, just to give a general idea, uh, some of you probably <clears throat> read the abstract, but one of the one of the uh, things that occurred to me over the course of doing this research and in subsequent years is that much of my original interest in working with the Sindawe and doing this project uh, in particular had to do with thinking about uh, a supposed transition from hunting and gathering to an agricultural uh, or pastoral kind of lifestyle. And um, it, I feel like you don't see this as often, but certainly in the, well, we do still see this in, in ethnobotanical articles, but certainly in the early 2000s, there was, there were quite a few articles about uh, leafy vegetables and other wild foods, especially in Africa. And the concern was that as um, people began, uh, continued to focus more heavily on things like cash crops, that their dietary breadth was being reduced and that this would uh, lead to a variety of uh, uh, health problems. And so it was a way for researchers to do both to try to assess local knowledge, but also do something productive with that knowledge. And, and certainly when I developed this project, it was very much uh, uh, 
uh, in line with that, that kind of kind of reasoning. But over time, one of the things that I came to realize is that um, that sort of a transition from foraging to farming uh, that I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with in, in historical reconstructions of this in general, if, if you know much about anthropological and archaeological theorizing, um, but also specifically in, in this part of the world, it doesn't really apply, at least not in a straightforward way. And uh, I don't necessarily think that practices uh, of the present day or the recent past necessarily uh, give us insight into what was happening in the long term. I think they could be used to develop new ideas and new models that we could test, but I don't think that it's a, um, that we can look at what's happening today and, and just in a straightforward manner project uh, into the past. And I'll, I'll walk us through how I got there. Um, and so I've, and so over the years, I've also been thinking about other ways that we could, that we could think about uh, how the Sandawa use these resources, but also how we could think about different kinds of, of models of intergroup interactions and models for the spread of food production that I think some of you uh, would be uh, interested in, especially given the linguistic uh, evidence that is demonstrating that there's been so much uh, um, borrowing and communication across groups over a very long period of time in this region. So uh, most of you are probably familiar with this, so I will go quickly, um, although it is helpful, I guess, for people who watch the recording. Um, is that still sharing? Yes. So the Sandawe are currently uh, settled farmers with a hunting and gathering tradition. Uh, they also keep uh, livestock, cattle, uh, goats, some sheep. And um, depending on the social situation, the Sandawe will, uh, even today, people will identify sometimes as a farmer, sometimes as a hunter gatherer. And sometimes in, even in the same sentence, it can change or the same conversation, it can change depending on the kinds of things that are being talked about. And um, one of the interesting things about the Sandawe, there's a lot of linguistic research about the Sandawe, relatively speaking, but there isn't much other kinds of, uh, of work that's been done with the Sandawe. And I have always thought, and I probably mentioned this last year, that that had to do with the fact that they, um, in an earlier period of anthropological research, they didn't really they didn't seem to be pure hunter-gatherers, but nor were they pure farmers. And so um, some of the ethnologically focused mm -hmm. kinds of studies of the past um, perhaps weren't as interested in, uh, in that regard. So, um, and, and the reason I think that's also important to talk about is that I always try to be very careful when I, when I, when I talk about narratives about the Sandawe or ideas about the Sandawe, because I want, I want to uh, acknowledge that there, isn't a lot and it's been written over a very long period of time so the perspectives have certainly changed uh, and I don't want to build a straw man argument so I'm aware of the fact that there isn't a lot and how people have how scholars have thought about you know what the Sandawe represent uh, in an ethnological uh, sense has has changed and um, I believe I showed this chart during my presentation last year but one of the one of the uh, realizations I had that led me down this path, it, it ended up being the topic of my master's and then grew into my doctoral work, was the fact that um, there were some very broad, there are some broad similarities in how the Sindawe are discussed in the literature today um, that, that do, so the ways that, that the Sindawe are discussed today do resemble in many ways how they were dis described in their first ethnographic accounts. Uh, in the 1890s. And, and this is a chart that summarizes that. So um, it's long been recognized that uh, the Sandawi language has click consonants in it. And for that reason, uh, there's been uh, interest in whether or not they are related and along what axes to uh, the Hadza, who are also in Tanzania, and groups in Southern Africa who uh, speak languages with click consonants. Uh, there's, there was also the, the ways that this was understood have varied, but there has also been a thought that the Sandawe are, uh, have uh, been admixed with other groups. Uh, so earlier on that focused on things like uh, bodily form and color and hair type. Now it looks at, at um, uh, genes. And then there's this sense that the Sandawe were at some point uh, foragers probably relying entirely on foraging. 
And finally, there's this idea that, um, and this is sort of taking all of those previous uh, uh, arguments together, is that the Sindawe must then be uh, the remnants of a, of a lineage that used to be much more widespread. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this chart, so I won't go into it too much, but um, their categorization as Khoisan has been controversial. Uh, and I will leave that to all of you to argue amongst yourselves. Uh, but there are also these other, these other kinds of studies that um, have attempted to reconstruct uh, linguistic relationships, but also genetic relationships. So in, and that's what I think is so interesting about doing a historiographic study of how the Sandawe have been talked about and fit into anthropological research is, is the ways that certain ideas recur, even if the ways that we study those ideas change. So going from studying uh, skull shape to studying uh, chromosomes and, and things like that. And yet some of these kinds of historical ideas uh, persist. So we can talk about that if you're interested. And this is another chart from uh, 2000. And eight from annual review of anthropology about the status of the Khoisan language. And since I'm sure you're familiar, I won't go into that. Uh, and this gives you a sense of the landscape. It's very hilly. Um, it uh, is quite forested, despite being a semi arid part of the country. Sometimes when I mention that it's semi arid, people expect that it would be more like a savanna, but it is actually uh, pretty heavily wooded. And um, I wanted to show this picture. Uh, this is some, this was taken during recent archaeological field work, but it was a group of men and women who'd climbed a young baobab tree to harvest uh, the leaves. And I'll actually return to these pictures uh, at the end of the presentation. And as I mentioned, um, the use of wild resources does remain important in this region and, and does contribute uh, to Sandawi identity today. I wanted to share this story just because I thought you might find it fun. Uh, when we were doing some excavations in 2017, a group of uh, young men came up to us and they, they sat down and were watching us and they go, are you, are you all hungry? And we're like, yeah, sure, what do you have to offer? And they're like, well, this hill, uh, we were excavated in a rock shelter that was partway up a hill. And he said, there's actually a lot of um, of hyrax, and so we could we could get you a hyrax, and I'd never actually eaten a hyrax before, so they went off and, and got one, and this is him preparing the hyrax. And on the first day, it was um, I think fifteen hundred shillings, but then the price went up to something like five thousand shillings as the uh, as we proved our demand, but also as the supply went down <laughs> of the hyrax on the hill. So that was kind of a fun story. Um, and here's a picture of me one day. Uh, they insisted that I take pictures with the bows and arrows, so I had to show that. Um, and going back to the leafy vegetables, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, there had been a lot of work on this topic, especially in the early 2000s, although you do continue to see it today. Part of why people were ethnobotanists were interested in specifically leafy vegetables, uh, as opposed to other kinds of wild foods, is that many of them uh, are somewhat weedy in nature, which is not meant to indicate something about their desirability, but it, their growth habits. So they grow in disturbed habitats. And um, many of them are, uh, they, they can be planted and, and, and consumed within fairly short order. So they grow quickly. Uh, they don't require a lot of input. Uh, they have a lot of, they're very nutritious. Uh, but there were many places where some of these studies have been done that indicated that uh, even in situations where people knew of a wide range of species, that they weren't using as many, but that they'd started to focus on just a few. And there were various reasons for that. Um, sometimes it had to do with uh, which... People had, in some places in Africa, for example, people were starting to focus on vegetables that could also be sold in local markets. And, um, and that led them to uh, disregard others that they knew about. Another concern was that there were few studies. So people were like, oh, this is a great resource, but we actually don't understand the full scope of what they contribute to diets. 
Uh, and the Sandawi homeland was interesting because it is drought prone. Uh, historically, it has been uh, marginalized, uh, but that there have been efforts to change that by building extra schools and, and things like that in the area and improving the transportation infrastructure. But historically, it had been somewhat marginalized within Tanzania. And um, sort of more broadly, uh, one of the reasons, or some of the reasons that people were interested in doing these kinds of studies is that uh, if these plants were no longer used, it meant that uh, we didn't have information about uh, potential uh, varieties of existing crops or, or locally grown crops that were not widely distributed that could be developed into uh, uh, more drought resistant or more nutritious varieties that could be grown in other parts of the world. And that this could increase the risk of uh, famine and malnutrition. So the project was originally uh, devised in order to think about global biodiversity, economic development, uh, cultural and historical transitions, and sort of individual preference. So what is the thought process that somebody goes through when they're actually deciding what to eat, basically? And I'll, I don't want to harp on this, because uh, I don't think it's the most interesting thing. But um, you are all probably familiar with these kinds of sequences, brand, you know, band tribe chiefdom state, it grows out of mid-century, well, it has earlier roots, but it really grows out of mid-century uh, anthropological theorizing in terms of trying to categorize different societies and uh, developmental trajectories in through time. And in many cases, foraging, especially African foraging, gets positioned as a precursor or a starting point or an a, a originary moment. And that uh, developed through a number of different uh, lines of work, but some examples of that would be uh, Marshall Solins in the 60s developed this idea of the original affluent society. And, and, and uh, his uh, analysis of some of the ethnographic work among Khoisan speaking groups in Southern Africa was that they uh, not only did not accumulate wealth, but actually had devised social strategies to prevent the accumulation of wealth. And uh, Woodburn's work, who was an ethnographer who worked among the Hadza in, in the 60s as well, in the 80s, he devised this model called the immediate return to the delayed return model, which has similarities to what uh, Solins had talked about in the 60s. And the idea is that um, low latitudes, so foragers closer to the equator uh, who live uh, in particular kinds of environments don't accumulate food stores. And so the idea is that nature itself is the warehouse. And whenever you need something, you go out and, and you get food. Uh, but you don't, you're not, uh, you're not trying to create or store a surplus. And that uh, in these kinds of models that developed in the 80s, uh, one of the key factors was latitude and environmental type. And so that as you went closer to the poles and uh, climate became more seasonal, it also meant that food sources became more unpredictable, more unpronounced or more pronounced over the course of the year, and that you had to devise new kinds of strategies to map on to those resources. And so people were able to then devise these various models about how um, the technology and the social forms necessary to uh, to obtain food were actually some of the models or the, the drivers of further social and historical elaboration in human history. Uh, and I, I can come back to that. So some of the things, one of the really fun things about this project is that it was funded through a Fulbright IIE US student fellowship and it gave me the resources to spend an entire, actually over a year, I think I was there for 13 months in the end, uh, studying this topic. And of course I was, you know, I was learning all sorts of other things, but this was really the, the key focus. And uh, at the time, I don't actually don't really know if there are others like this, but at the time this kind of a project was, was really unprecedented for Africa because a lot of ethnobotanical studies were very short-term, oftentimes over a matter of weeks. 
or tacked on to uh, a larger project. And so we're not the, the key focus. And so I had an entire year and this allowed me to think about uh, the use of these resources over the, over the course of that entire year and really get a holistic picture. And I, it was also a lot of fun because I just graduated uh, with my BA. And so I use it as an opportunity to uh, practice some of the quantitative and qualitative research methods that I do, that I've learned about in classes, and also to try out new things, to devise new, new methods uh, that might work for what I was trying to get at. And one of the first things that I did was, I wasn't really sure why I did it, but I thought I needed to do it <laughs> from having taken my methods courses was I did a village census, uh, but it actually was a lot of fun and it helped me, it helped me get to know everybody so that they were comfortable with me asking strange questions. But a lot of information did start to come out of that. So in addition to asking people, how many people live in this household? Uh, what are your What are the languages that you speak? Um, I was able to ask, like, do you know anything? Like, are there any particular species of, of leafy vegetables that you eat? And can you tell me anything about them? And so it was a way to just get some, like, a rough idea of how people were thinking and talking about these plants. Another thing that I did was um, I would walk with people through their through their fields. And, and say, can you just give me a tour of what you're growing? You know, point out, even if you think I know what it is, just tell me what it is and why you're growing it, and some of the challenges or other things that you face. And so that was one way that I started to build up the list of, of the different plants. And once I started to have this list, I then began doing uh, botanical collections, which is this picture in the top center. And I did that so that um, we, we can talk about this. I, I imagine this is something that all of you would uh, be interested in is there's a big difference between folk taxonomy and um, uh, botanical Linnaean taxonomy. And so uh, it was, I, I knew that it would be important to, uh, to take voucher specimens of all of the different plants that people were using and get those identified um, so that I could speak with non Sandawe about them. And I also um, would. One, one thing I realized is that a lot of these plants were being grown in the fields, but uh, not everybody, but a fairly large number of people in Quam Toro, which is the town where I was living. And I was going out everywhere, but mainly focused in, in Quam Toro, did have kitchen gardens. And so I also spoke with people about their gardens to, to find out how long have you been gardening? Why did you decide to do it? Uh, and that helped me learn about a bit more about um, how households help each other at different points in time over the course of the year, and also how people uh, use the garden to um, to plan uh, things like cash flow in, in order to have vegetables to sell in local markets and things like that. And then to uh, uh, let me go to the next slide. I forget what I put. Yeah, uh, I also. Um, I weighed greens to the extent that I could. That ended up not really being a useful strategy, but I wanted to try to get a sense of uh, how much are people eating when they are eating them, because that would help me try to get to uh, this question of, of quantifying how much they actually contribute from a nutritional perspective to diet. That sort of fell through for various reasons. Uh, and I also did food diaries where I would give people, um, uh, I would purchase pens and notebooks, and I would ask people just to list everything that they ate for every meal for a certain number of weeks. That was useful and, and did, I was, I was actually doing that to recreate a study that had been done in the area in the 70s and 80s, but um, that can be seen as very invasive. So you need, to be, you need to be sure that you have a good relationship with the people that are doing it if you want that to be successful. Another thing that I did, and, and the picture on the top left is an example of this, is I, towards the end of the project, when I thought I sort of had a sense of what was going on, I did do a series of focus groups with uh, men and women. That was the request that we, we uh, split them. And we talked about uh, their description of the year in terms of, in terms of uh, obtaining food, so where it comes from. Uh, when are you farming? When are you planting? Uh, when are the crops uh, ripening? When can you first start harvesting them? 
When do you experience food shortage? When are things like honey or other wild resources available? Are there any times of the year when, uh, when people are most prone to experience uh, food shortage and poverty? Things like that. Uh, I also, to the extent that I could, would document how people were collecting, processing, and storing all these different resources. So in the bottom left, there are some mushrooms, uh, which was a ton of fun. <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest and went mushroom hunting as a kid, and we only ever went mushroom hunting for morels, but there were like 20 different mushrooms that we harvested <laughs> that year. It was so much fun. Um, this in the top right, this picture up here, I was really, I had learned about some of these uh, grass seeds that people uh, reported using if they were low on food stores. And so I was interested in uh, how that was harvested and the kinds of yields you could get from that. So we went out one day uh, when, when that kind of grain was ready to harvest and we just, they taught me how to do it and we just went around and, and collected it all. Uh, another thing that became really important <clears throat> was as I was speaking to people about how they prepare the vegetables, it became apparent that there are different kinds of salts and sodas, uh, mainly collected from local lakes that people use in the preparation of different kinds of vegetables. And so then uh, this was kind of a, uh, a tangent, but a really fun one. Uh, I spent about a month <clears throat> going around during the dry season when people are producing the salt, going around to the different spots in this region and speaking with the mainly women who are gathering the soils that are used to uh, extract the salt and sodas. And that was really fascinating. And that's also interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, thinking over the longer term, uh, because salt is, is very important for livestock, but also is important to uh, farmers who don't have livestock. And so thinking about, um, <clears throat> thinking about longer term regional economies. Unfortunately, I did return to many of these sites uh, to look for archeological evidence and we couldn't find any archeological evidence, but there are salt production sites elsewhere in Tanzania where we have archeological evidence going back at least, I think it's 1500 years. We know some of these sites have been in, in use for quite some time. And then the final that I wanted to talk about were pile sorts. So this is this was uh, great fun as well. Once I had what I thought was a fairly comprehensive list, I wrote for each um, each variety that the Sandawe recognized, some of which were botanically speaking the same species. I wrote each variety's name on a card and I would give uh, people the stack of cards and I would say you can uh, you can put these in, in, in as many groups as you want. Um, but initially there can't be any single card groups. And, and so then they split them however they want. And then you take each of those groups and you repeat the process. And so then you, you get ever refined uh, uh, categories from their perspective. And this, this research strategy is fairly widespread, I would say in, in ethnobotany and, and not just ethnobotany, even certain kinds of uh, linguistic research actually. Um, but it allows you to see, are there uh, common trends in how people uh, define these, uh, these plants? Okay. Uh, and here are some pictures from uh, some of that research. So on the left, this was interesting. Uh, this was an amaranthus uh, species that I saw in two or three gardens that had actually just been introduced to the area. Uh, and it was a variety called Mchicha sindano, which refers to its long, sharp shape. It's supposed to look like a needle. And the, that was one situation where I could actually trace how the seeds were passed from one person to another uh, because it was in so few gardens. And then on the right uh, is a plant uh, called uh, Ganondropsis ganandra. And uh, in English, that's called uh, uh, spider plant. Uh, or Cleome is another genus name for it, or another uh, word. You, you see it in a lot of people's gardens. If you were to look up the picture, you, many of you would probably recognize it. And these are some other pictures uh, from the gardens. So in the, in the top right, this woman, uh, she grew a lot of 
uh, tomatoes to sell on a local market. Uh, on the left is a variety of sweet potato that uh, she would consume, but also sell if she had extra. Uh, and on the right uh, was a garden of amaranthus with the Ganondropsis. And speaking with this, uh, with these two families, they shared this area. And one of the things that I that I learned is that um, if people wanted to set up a garden, or even in the field, if they wanted particular kinds of species, that uh, that they would pay attention to where the livestock had been eating, and then they would use that manure to fertilize particular areas in order to get the seeds to uh, to sprout in that area. Um, and I've already showed this picture in the top right of trying to harvest those seeds. And uh, on the bottom right, I thought this was really interesting as well. So um, all of these are the bottom two, the ones that have the alternating green and yellowish stripes. Those botanically speaking are the same species, but there is a variety that people recognize and they do save the seeds from. Uh, where the fruits are more like a cucumber, they're not bitter. The ones with the spikes on the left are intensely bitter, uh, but the ones on the right you can eat like a vegetable. And so that, that's an example of, um, I mean, I, I really do think it's an example of like uh, the unintentional and intentional selection of a, of a new edible variety from these plants that are, that are growing in association in agricultural fields, but are not themselves domestic. So this is sort of pointing towards that kind of a process. And there's been a lot of speculation by anthropologists and archaeologists about the different processes through which plants actually become domesticated. So that was that was fun. The one on the top left is also inedible, but uh, was reported to have domestic or medicinal uses. Uh, and then here are some pictures of the salt and soda collection. This was from the west area of the Sandawe homeland uh, near an uh, area called Takwa. And there's a very large, it's near the Mponde River, which is uh, at the base of the escarpment. And so there are a lot of ephemeral lakes through that region, uh, but also there are low-lying marshy areas. And over time, uh, salt, uh, has built up in those sediments. And during, so just after the, the rainy season, while the ground is still kind of uh, moist, is when people will go in to uh, collect the salt in this area. So what happens, there's a very large expanse, you know, many hundreds of meters across, where people have done this for, I don't know how long, quite some time, at least 50 years, uh, based on conversations with folks, but probably much longer than that. And the, in, over the course of the day, salt will begin to form on the top layer of the soil. And as you can see in the top left, you can take a piece of metal or a rock or just anything with a sharp edge, a piece of a plastic bucket and scrape it across the top. And then you can build up a pile of sediment. Uh, you put the sediment in one of these uh, gourd bowls, which has a small, hole at the bottom that's covered with leaves, and then you pass water through it. That uh, helps the uh, salt to dissolve, and hopefully the sediment gets caught by the leaves, but the brine passes through, and then uh, it is boiled over a, over a fire until it begins to um, come out of solution, and then it's broken into pieces and dried in the sun. And that uh, and so people will do this for household production, but will also sell this in local markets. There's a bit of tension around this because uh, salt, locally produced salt, is supposed to be iodized. And some people uh, don't want to do that because it does have an extra cost. And other people, depending on the, use, the uses to which it is being put, say that if it's iodized, it won't be as effective. So for example, if you're using this to cook Melinda, uh, which is the um, uh, mucilaginous side dish with ugali made of leafy vegetables and okra and things like that. Um, many people say that iodized salt uh, uh, impacts the texture in a way that they don't like. Or if you are, uh, or that it could re reduce the strength of a medicinal plant. So there's, there's some tension around this locally about whether or not 
people actually iodize. And some people have gotten in trouble over the years for it. Uh, this on the upper left is a really astonishing uh, location. It's near Sanzawa in the Southwest and of the Sandawe homeland. And this is a small stream that actually runs over the edge right here during the rainy season and continues on and becomes quite small for downstream again. Uh, but there's this area that's about 30 meters across and, and maybe 200 or 300 meters long where all of this sediment has been um, excavated at some point in the past and used to produce salt. And people also bring their livestock here. Uh, but again, unfortunately, there really just was not any archaeological material around it. Uh, these are some of these are just some other pictures to give you a sense of the the kinds of landscapes uh, that you often find salt in. And these trees at the top uh, in Swahili are called mchumbi chumbi, and partly because the the leaves do taste salty, and you can extract salt from from the ash of the leaves. So that was a fun. Uh, side trip. So now I'm going to give some general observations from over the course of the year. Uh, <clears throat> one was that when people eat it, they eat about 100 grams a person, which is um, about the size of a baseball. Not huge. Um, that number was actually quite difficult <laughs> to get. Uh, because, and I'll talk about this later, but one of the, <clears throat> one of the things that became apparent pretty quickly actually, was that people were happy to talk to me about these food resources in a general sense, but there was a lot of hesitancy, even among close friends of mine, to talk, to speak with me in detail about uh, how much, how much people, how much food of a particular kind people have on hand at any point in time. Uh, and so the way that I was able to derive that number was uh, I would mainly focus on friends of mine rather than people I didn't know. But if I saw them coming home from the market or coming back from a field, I would say, hey, could I, how much of that do you have? Could I weigh it really quickly? And then say, how many people do you expect to eat this? But once it was actually in the home, that was, that was basically off limits. That was considered to be a, a siri andani, so a, a domestic secret. And uh, one thing that was really fascinating is um, that a large number of the species, but not all of the species, are actually dried for consumption during the dry season. And that, of course, increases the predictability and the reliability of, of having this food available. Uh, young leaves are generally, for most species, considered to be the most palatable. And over the course of the year, as plants become more mature, uh, people would become more selective in what they were harvesting. Another thing that people do is that, um, and I can go back to, well, yeah, I can go back to this picture is that, uh, and I'll, I'll speak about this in more detail in a moment, but at a certain time of the year, so many of these species grow in the fields and they're, they really effectively operate as a secondary crop. Once they, become, once they become big enough to start competing with the corn and the sorghum the millet, they're uprooted whole and taken back home and then all of the leaves are plucked and many of them will be, will be dried. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there are relatively few gardens. And it's really only among, uh, there's sort of two categories of people. So adult women who would like a, uh, a extra cash flow and uh, students who were towards the end of primary school or the beginning of secondary school who had been taught how to uh, build a raised bed in order to grow vegetables for the market. And so they were trying that out on their own at home were sort of the two categories. Um, and I probably should have put this first, but uh, here are some just general numbers. So there's at least 66. At, the, at that year, when I did the research, I documented 66 species just of leafy vegetables. This is not looking at fruits. This is not looking at roots or other things. It's just the leafy vegetables, so it's a lot. In years since then, this number has actually gotten up to like 73. There are more than this. Uh, but I am not going to talk about those in the article that I published because I haven't had them identified yet. And so I can't do too much with it. Uh, I'm calling the flowers a leafy vegetable as well of two species. Uh, there are two species where the flowers that are consumed, not the leaves. So one of them, for example, is an aloe. So you can imagine eating the aloe leaves might not be very nice. 
uh, but the, the flowers are considered to be a top-notch vegetable. And the rest are, are the leaves. Of these, uh, 55 are annual, which means that they uh, will sprout from seed, grow to maturity, and then die by the end of the year. And 11 are perennial, so they come back every year. And um, of the 66, a third of them are dried for consumption during, during the dry season. And oh, this slide was from a presentation I gave once to a, a friend's undergraduate introductory anthropology class. So that's the, I'm sure all of you know, have some sense of wild and, and domestic. But it was fairly evenly split, split between what I would consider to be domestic. So plants that are not local to the area and that depend on human cultivation for survival. Uh, about a third of them are wild, which I believe, which I have reason to believe are native to the region. And about a third of them are semi-domestic, meaning they tend to grow in disturbed places. So near the house, just around homesteads, or in actively cultivated or recently abandoned fields. Uh, they may be cultivated. So some of them have their seeds saved purposely and cast into fields. Some of them are spread uh, some, sometimes more inadvertently through manuring of fields and, and things like that. So they, you generally don't see these plants growing in places where there's not obvious evidence of human interaction with the environment. Uh, but they also don't necessarily depend on close maintenance by people in order to grow. So there's this third, and some of these, I think this is actually a really great follow-up project. Some of these may be native to the region, some of them may not. And I think that that's the sort of thing that we could get. You could get to that kind of information through a variety of botanical, genetic, and, and linguistic research. Um, but those plants are, are especially interesting uh, because they, they're the ones that sort of represent the, the, the best options for trying to develop new crop varieties. But the wild ones are also really important too because they um, grow in that area and oftentimes don't need things like extra water input. Um, and let me go to the next slide. One of the things that I'd hoped to do was understand like, is there a relationship between where these things grow and what people are selecting? And certainly some people prefer certain vegetables over another. I know we're short on time, so I'll try to go quickly. Um, but the other thing, but I actually kind of gave up on it because at the beginning of the rainy season, because people are, because of, uh, because people are actively spreading these seeds and because so much of the area is disturbed for agriculture, in the at the beginning of the rainy season, the area is almost, I mean, in some places, it's, it's truly a carpet of some of these edible species. And so, trying to do a transect, which is where I pick a randomly selected area and I, and I count up the number of species and then figure out like which ones are actually being used and not used, it just didn't make sense. So I, I pretty much abandoned that line of, um, of research. And I, I referenced this earlier, but there, there are a lot of different disturbed types. So it's not just homesteads and fields, but um, actively abandoned fields. Uh, will oftentimes for a couple of years be populated with some of these semi-domestic species. Walking paths, livestock trails, there's really a wide variety of places where you can find these plants. And um, domestic species, I mean, it is it, unsurprisingly, you pretty much only find those in fields and gardens. Uh, the semi-domestic species tend to grow in places where there, where there is a lot of active disturbance of the sediment. Wild species, are often growing on their own and, and people will make specific trips to get particular kinds of these uh, wild species, especially at a certain time of the year, but they are also sometimes cultivated. So sometimes people will uh, transplant a baobab tree or they'll purposely build a house near a baobab tree for particular reasons, it's just one example. So it's not that wild indicates that there's absolutely no interaction with people. Sometimes people know where these are, where these stands are and will, will help uh, promote their growth. And um, so thinking about domestic versus wild, which I was using initially uh, because those were the categories I was coming in with. And, and I do think they do reveal some interesting information, but they don't, they're not enough to really get what's going on. 
Um, the 23 domestic species are often eaten because they, they're easy to buy in markets, so things like cabbages, um, but they're also very bulky and filling, and that's why people, that is one reason why people mention that they do like to grow the domestic vegetables. Um, this is a conversation that I had with Helen Eaton probably 15 years ago, and I believe she's on the call. Um, but we, I, I had given her the list of vegetables and was interested if she was able to figure out from the names of the vegetables which of them uh, might be loan words from another language. And about 22 of them do look like they're loan words. Some of them are very obviously, it's just the word that everybody uses in, in Swahili across Tanzania for it. Uh, some of them aren't, and I, I haven't been able to, to really dig into that to figure that out. Okay. And this is an example of the, the community calendar we made. Uh, this is just some of the detail, but it uh, gives you a sense of, of, uh, of when some of the really difficult and easy times are from a food perspective. And what it turned out is that um, really January into March is a very difficult time of the year. Uh, food stores are starting to get low in November and December, and the new crops have not come in especially if the rains are delayed. So it's those first few months of the year that are especially difficult in this region. And one of the things that was really fascinating to me from, uh, from there were two things in particular, the pile sorts, but also I made a calendar of which, like each month, which vegetables are available now and are they available fresh or dried? And the folk taxonomy, so there's this word, ah, which, which I think I said right, which is leaves. And within that, there were two categories to make melinda, which is, are the, the leaves that you um, boil and, and stir and they break apart. You can sometimes add things like okra and it becomes very sticky and that helps your ugali go down. And then there are vegetables that are used uh, to make what in Swahili people refer to as mchicha, which is basically, just a sauteed uh, vegetable that retains its its shape for the most part, or it doesn't it doesn't break down and become mucilaginous. It can just be sauteed, whatever you want in it. Within the vegetables for uh, to make them lenda, uh, there's there are vegetables that are only eaten fresh at the start of the rains, and almost all of those species tend to be wild. They're also considered to be particularly delicious and especially important for getting through that time period when the food stores are, are low, and that's called humburu. Uh, and then there's kankasa, which are the, those species that can also be dried, that are used to make a melinda, but can also be dried and eaten later. And so kankasa also just refers to basically re, rehydrated vegetable melinda. And um, the, the vegetables that are used to make the, just the sauteed kind of, uh, leaves, those are called nani. And then if they're dried, it's called sansa. And here's uh, an example. I made a, a chart based on the information of what's available when. And as you can see, uh, so even though January through March is when food stores are at their lowest, it is also the period of time when the number of vegetables available to eat is actually at the highest. Um, and it gets even more interesting than that. And you can see why that is. And it, and it has a lot to do with, so in the period between really, I would say November and March, that is when it's the beginning of the rains and you're having a lot of these wild species that are just starting to leaf out. So you have the fresh vegetables from the wild species available, but then you're also starting to use the dried vegetables that you that you dried during the previous rainy season. And so it's during that time period when you have the maximum number of, of vegetables available. Yeah, it's probably not true that you, you know, you probably have a difficult time surviving on only the vegetables, um, but it nonetheless provides some, um, some much appreciated uh, diversity during a, during a difficult time of the year. Uh, I, I've already mentioned some of these things. Uh, so uh, it took a long time to, under, to learn what kinds of questions are okay to ask, what really aren't, uh, or um, when it's appropriate to ask certain kinds of questions. And also this idea of a weed, when I use that, it's more of a, 
it has to do with its growth habit, nothing about whether or not it's useful. Women uh, did report doing most of the work, but I also did surveys of men and women of different ages. And it's clear that, that the men know about nearly as many species, basically the same number of species as the women. And um, they certainly don't hesitate to harvest, especially if they come across like a particularly desired wild species. Um, there were also some other little fun things that came up is that a couple of the wild species turn colors if you let them sit overnight. And so some are eaten right away because that color is considered unappealing and so you would never eat it as a leftover. So those are, these are some of those things that I probably won't put in that article. It's like extra little cultural uh, color, but you know, what to really do with it. It was also clear that some of these species are both medicinal and um, used as food. And in some cases it has to do with the preparation. So if you're going to use it as a medicine, you don't use salt when you cook it or you don't change the water. If you're going to eat as the vegetable, you'd add salt and you would change the water. And some of this has to do with how bitter it is. And, and so the, the bitterness is what's seen as the evidence that it is a medicinal plant. Um, there were also these other little things, like I mentioned, like the salt that only came out from like sitting in people's kitchens and actually asking them about everything they were doing. Um, and I also learned about all these other little fun things like uh, there's a variety of condiments. Like they're not really understood to be food plants. They really are understood to be kind of like spices. And so I want to, I would like to do some more research about that, but I, I wasn't able to get voucher specimens of those. So I know what they're called, but I don't know what the species is. Um, and I wanted to return to these two pictures because I, it was sort of a bait and switch. And I'm, I'm almost done. I hope we have a little bit of time for questions, but um, it was kind of a bait and switch. Like I, I did this on purpose. I put it here because you could look at that and think, oh, it's, it's just the bush. It's like the back country in the Sindawi homeland for those of you who've been there. Like, you know, it's not, not like this if you're closer into the towns. Well, this is actually an abandoned field and all of the light brown areas back there are other abandoned fields. This is during the dry season. So I can't tell if there were leafy vegetables that had been growing in here but there probably were. And, um, and then also with this baobab tree, one of the, this again was a bit of bait switch, but if you pay attention, this is a, a fallowed um, sweet potato field. You can tell from the ridges. And so one of the things that got me thinking a lot about foraging and farming and, and whether or not it made sense to think about like, the, about the contemporary Sandawe food practices as, as transitional had to do with the fact that in some sense, the entire landscape is cultivated and, um, and very actively so. And, and that was part of why I was saying that these categories like wild and domestic don't really apply. And, then it, and this is one case where it really, I think does make sense to use the local categories and understandings for these plants and their relationships to each other, because it allows you to understand that the system itself actually exceeds the categories that we have to explain it, like foraging and farming. It is, neither foraging and farming, and it is also both foraging and farming. It's something else. And because if you look at, at the way that these plants, that they interact with these plants through space and time across the entire landscape, uh, it has elements of both. And, and I think you lose out uh, on understanding just how complex it is by trying to describe it as foraging or farming. And um, one of the things, one small shift and it's funny because I use this term in my dissertation. I do not describe why at all. One small shift that I've made is that I've started talking about food getting repertoires rather than subsistence categories because subsistence categories like foraging and farming and pastoralist are so closely associated with those sequences that I showed earlier, like band, tribe, chiefdom, and state that it's almost impossible to use these categories without importing those kinds of assumptions about what the group or what the practice represents in a historical sense. And part of why I came up with food getting repertoire is because it, 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 it is more neutral in a certain sense. And it, is, um, it, it avoids ascribing a particular term to what they're doing. It's really just trying to get at what is the full scope of what people are doing to obtain food. And um, another thing that I've been thinking a lot about is, um, and within anthropology over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of writing on infrastructure 
And the writing on infrastructure within anthropology tends to be uh, done by people who are interested in anthropological analyses of the modern state. And so looking at how things like road or electricity or water create particular kinds of governing forms and modes of citizenship. But I've actually been playing with this idea of infrastructure to be like, can we think of a non-modern infrastructure or not even non-modern, but like a, a modern uh, infrastructure or just uh, outside the, the particular sort of concerns of, of modernity. And I've been thinking a lot about how in this place, like if you wanna think about infrastructure, the wild species in some sense could be seen as a form of infrastructure that actually allow um, in, uh, uh, heavier reliance on agriculture than might otherwise be possible. And so you could think about how this knowledge, in fact, uh, how the knowledge of these plants and the use of these plants actually creates the foundation upon which other things can exist in, in the region. In that sense, you could think of it as a form of infrastructure. Um, and I didn't put anything on this slide. I think this is the last slide. Yes. Um, the one thing that I'd be happy to talk to all of you about is that I think it, for those of you who were able to see my presentation last year about my dissertation, one of the things that I've been really interested in is think, is looking at linguistic and ethnographic and archaeological evidence of interaction and exchange in this area through time. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I think it would be, would be unwise to try to speculate. I just don't think we have enough information uh, to speculate uh, how this system first came in and what it might say about some sort of supposed transition. Uh, one of the problems in terms of thinking about this archeologically is that leafy vegetables probably aren't going to preserve archeologically in this region and nor would the seeds because a lot of times the plants are being picked when they're immature and archeologically the evidence that we have of past diets is from charred remains and oftentimes charred seeds those likely aren't going to make it into hearts. Doesn't mean, I mean, it's possible, just might not be very likely. And I haven't actually been able to process any of the archeological sediments I have. But I do think that um, thinking a bit more broadly about how people are actually using the various kinds of resources that are available in this part of Tanzania in a much fuller sense that are, that are not as tied to ethno-linguistic categories or these other kinds of um, developmental historical categories could allow all of us to um, to then begin thinking about like for you know for example I would like to do some more research into uh, what do the what do the what does the borrowed terminology what might that indicate about which groups ancestral Sandawe were interacting with uh, and what they were doing so it gives another sort of line of research to to begin pulling out the evidence of the of the interaction and the exchange rather than trying to do these um, you know isolated uh, group centric uh, uh, studies and instead focus on networked relations so with that I'll leave it there but I will pull up my last slide just to because I've been given a lot of support to do this research over the years so I want to make sure I acknowledge everybody but yes if there is if there's any time left I would be happy to ask her to answer a question and I'll I'll go ahead and end the well, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. I think this is a really rich um, talk and there's really sort of a lot for us to, uh, to chew over, I think I would. Uh, so this, is, uh, this begins the question answer period of, um, of the webinar. And um, so I will remind our participants uh, that they can uh, indicate that they want to ask a question by raising their hand or they can write uh, their question in the chat module uh, here. Uh, I will remind everybody that the webinar is being recorded. Uh, so if you, do, uh, if you do decide to give a voice question, your voice will be recorded um, with the video. And I already see some hands up. So um, <clears throat> Martin, why don't, you, uh, why don't you unmute yourself and, uh, and uh, give us your question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Matthew, maybe I'll also reveal myself. Yeah, um, this, um, yeah, I find it very interesting. And I've, uh, um, I, I think many, many groups uh, use 
usually he uh, uh, use all sides, sorts of key three vegetables. And I, I regret that I didn't look uh, enough into it uh, when I did my field work. I first, um, maybe two specific uh, questions that I'm highly interested in is, is there any, any um, thing that, that, that the Sandawe will gather uh, for which they would need a grinding stone to eat it? So nuts or things like that. Mm. Yes. So of course, most households households do still have uh, grinding stones, but for for a lot of the major grains, uh, people will pay uh, a small amount of money to have that ground sort of as they of course, at, at that local yeah. market or at the local um, stores. But there are so. Uh, some of the plants that were, and, and unfortunately, like I said, I don't actually know the species, but some of the plants that were used as condiments are ground, and they uh, they would oftentimes be ground along with the the melinda, the mucilaginous dish. And when people are using the dried leaves, so one thing I didn't mention in the talk is that when when drying the leaves, uh, you will oftentimes uh, roll them between your hands to help. Uh, break up the cells and allow them to dry faster. You don't do that as much with the plants that make a melinda because that can cause some of the proteins to start to develop. So um, what people will do quite often with the melinda is the dried leaves for a melinda is they will grind those on a on a on a grindstone before they put them in the water. So so it's basically put in the water as a powder when they're making that dish. Whereas if you're making it fresh, you'll oftentimes just put in the whole leaves or chopped up leaves, and then you boil them long enough and they basically disintegrate. Uh, quite a few of, there are several grains that have been reported to me as, um, as famine foods. So, but I, and there are various reasons for this, I didn't see it being consumed and I didn't come across anybody who had reported having consumed it in recent years. Whether or not anybody had, that might have to do with how comfortable they are. People were happy to talk about the plant as a food plant, but nobody revealed to me that they had actually eaten it. Um, but one of those grains that we went out and harvested, they, they showed me uh, how to grind it. And part of why for that particular species, one reason that people said that they didn't like to make it is because the seed is so small that it's really difficult to grind on, on the grind stem. So there, yeah, there are wild, wild things that people are using. Um, one thing I would actually like to do, I think I might've mentioned this last summer, is during my archeological field work, we very rarely recorded the location of grindstones. But one thing I would love to do is get little, as like a community archeology span thing for primary school students or secondary school students. You can buy these really small GPS receivers and have everybody put a list of all of the different grindstones that we find in a particular area to try to see if I could actually sort of ascertain something about past settlement practices based on location of grindstones. So. Thank you. Yeah, your last point was my second question, uh, more or less, because uh, I mean, the background is, of course, that I'm interested in the, the finds of these grindstones in Lukumanda mm -hmm. in the southern Bulu Plateau. And does it indicate whether those people were having uh, agriculture or not? Mm -hmm. And then, so one of the the the, the grains that that uh, that domesticated grains that people feel is very old for the Cushitic side of that area would be finger millet, mm -hmm. and and there is also a wild finger millet. So I was wondering, I, I'm dying to know whether among those those wild grains that people gather, there would be wild finger millet. Yes. So I know that there, there has, there have been, and I, I would be happy to put together some uh, uh, small bibliography and send those of you who are interesting or interested in it. I know that there's been some uh, ethnographies of use of uh, finger millet and other wild grains. The, there is also a recently published article where, so one of the problems is that in East Africa, well, it's only been within the last 15 or 20 years that people have been doing archaeobotany. So we, compared to other parts of Africa, we actually have very little direct evidence of agriculture 
especially from, from the Tanzanian interior. Uh, in fact, I don't think we, we do have charred rice from the coast, but we don't have any direct evidence yet from the Tanzanian interior. But there is an archaeological article that you got published from Kenya where they did find finger millet. Uh, I don't remember the date that came back on it. Uh, one of the nice things is that if you get and if you find a grindstone in an excavated context, it is possible that you can that you can um, uh, that you can extract uh, pollen and phytolith, these tiny little plant parts that can be used to identify plants from the grindstone. But we haven't done anything like that in Tanzania yet. So the possibility is there, uh, but uh, technically, but the research just hasn't been hasn't been done. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm going to move to our first uh, text question. Uh, first of all, Mani says, thank you for the nice talk, Matthew. This opens up my own thinking about a future project on leafy vegetables. Excellent. Let me know if you'd <laughs> like to chat about it. I because, uh, always Amani, love to about leafy vegetables. Amani has done some significant work with, uh, with, uh, with, with plants and, uh, and, and their uses in central Tanzania, but also with the Hadzabe. Uh, okay. So I think you two would probably have some interesting conversations to be had. Um, um, and then uh, Amani asked, one quick question for the names of wild crops. How many had been assigned Swahili names? I find it easy for the domesticated leafy vegetables to obtain foreign words, but this cannot be the same for wild vegetables. Do you have any thoughts on that? So when I was doing the work, one thing that I tried to do was um, uh, obtain as many names for the same variety that people were happy to give me in whatever language they were happy to give it to me. And actually one of the things that, that, uh, that I probably should have mentioned and that really did, it slowed things down, uh, but in funny ways, uh, I was doing all the research in Swahili and, and, and not Sindawe. And so one of the days when I was doing one of these transects before I realized that it was a futile, it was like an un, unnecessarily quantitative approach that was going to tell me nothing. Uh, we were going through, we'd put a, a transect in, in a field, and the man who owned the field and I were going through and identifying all of the plants growing in it, and he just kept saying, this was mchicha, this was mchicha, this was mchicha, and finally I was like, they all look alike, and he goes, well, yeah, they're different kinds of mchicha, and it was so funny because I should have known that, and yet, and so, and so then I went back through, <laughs> and I Luckily, this was very early on, and so I, I made sure when I was asking people, so, okay, this is a mchicha, what kind of mchicha is it? Uh, do you have a name, another name for it in Swahili? Do you have a name for it in Sandawe? And so in the article that I will publish, I'm going to give the, the Sandawe name, the Swahili name, English name, but even that is not quite right because there are some, there are some names for which the, the name is actually a, like in order for the Sandawe use the same name for it and they recognize them as two different, there's this one plant where they, they use the same name for it, but they recognize it as two different varieties, but they don't have different words for it. And so in order to describe the difference to me, they added on qualifiers in Swahili. And so I just made sure to, to keep track of that. And then that's also in the same table as the uh, uh, botanical classification. So it, it does end up being a mix. And as I recall, it was mainly the semi-domestic species, which is interesting, that, that had consonant combinations that indicated that they were probably loanwords. It wasn't actually the, the domestic species. The domestic species, so in Swahili, for example, cabbage is kabichi, which is, I would say, fairly obviously a loan word from English. Um, so, so for quite a few of the domestic species, it's it's very it seems to me to be very clearly recently borrowed in from Swahili or English. It doesn't mean that the plant hadn't been grown there longer and had a different name at some point in the past. So all of this to say, uh, just be very explicit 
uh, and remember to ask them if they can think of any other words in other languages, because I wasn't doing that at first. And, and it, I needed to, luckily it was at the beginning, so there wasn't too much that I had to redo, but yeah. I'll, uh, I'll add this little, um, this little snippet. Um, one, of your, one of your plant types was called Sansa. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I know that in Ihanzu, um, there's a, that's, that's a word that's used for, for either a species of plant or a type of food that comes from plant. And I don't think it's Mlenda, I think it's something else. So, I mean, for me, it's just something that I found in Ihanzu, but of course I wouldn't be surprised if that bled down through into, you know, as far as Nyatu yeah. possibly, I mean, that could be a, now, whether that means that it, it's a it's a it's a Bantu form or it's a form that came from Sandawe and then and then made its way up, that's another question. But it's a neat it's a neat little um it's a neat little link. Yeah. Oh, and Amani, I just saw your follow up comment. So another thing that I do is in I made this table and I actually do indicate if the plant is used generally for Mlenda or Mchicha. So that's a very good point too. So you have all the different names and there's all the different uses that they can be put to. Yeah. Thank you for that, Amani. Great. Um, Bob? Thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, identifying these is just a nightmare and very difficult, and I, I recognize that. And uh, and it's so interesting that you're working on these leafy greens because that has to be one of the hardest things to find a logical trace for. Now, before I get to my question, I just say I love all the stuff on the salt collection. I wish, yeah, that that had. It was more better known for other other groups too. Now my question is, a lot of these things would be called weeds. I'm wondering, do you have things that are true weeds with the sundown? Mm -hmm. That is, you have specifically created a garden to take these, put these symbols in, yet there are other species that like to come in. And I put this Samson 86 reference in here. He, they're considering that there are certain plants like say Opuntia, which is a prickly pear, that they find in disturbed areas, areas where there used to be a camp. And they, they're saying that these were hunter gatherers. I don't know that they really know they were hunter gatherers versus um, people with cattle or sheep or something. But I'm wondering what kind of unintentional plants come in these disturbed areas? And are any of those ones where you might be able to find seeds or archeological traces as opposed to the ones that you really are intending? Mm -hmm. Or, uh... That is an amazing question. I love that question. And I, uh, I have, I'm so amazed because it's never crossed my mind and it made me so excited to think about. <laughs> uh, now I have to do a follow up to the leafy vegetable project. I think that is an amazing question, actually. And I am absolutely going to talk to people about that when I go okay, back. Okay, well, I'll, I'll add the article I can uh, email you. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. To go, I think you put a question in the chat about sample right. size. Right, and that's um, an important question too, but I felt yeah. more strongly about this other one. What are yeah. weeds? <laughs> are so there weeds? The, um, in a lot of the, so there's this weird, I shouldn't say it's weird. Um, to answer your question in a straightforward manner, uh, usually it's about 30 and that's just because different kinds of statistical tests that you can put on 30 of each sub sample within a universe. Cause and, I don't think most, no, most linguists do not do that. Let me just yeah. put it out there. Well, <laughs> we are and that actually, that. and that actually comes from, from statistics and it has to do with the minimum number that you can have to do statistics reliably if you're looking to do statistics. So I, there is also there. And there's a lot of conversation in this among more quantitatively oriented ethnobotanists. Uh, there are statistics out there for sample sizes for small populations. So when I did the survey, I did this very basic survey, for example, the village census ended up coming in being useful because Guam Toro has a lot of people of many different ethnolinguistic backgrounds from all over the country. And so people who were born and raised locally might know the vegetables, but other people wouldn't. And so I actually did use the census in order to um, uh, figure out like who has only recently moved to Guam Toro, so I didn't include them in the survey. Um, but I still, in order to be statistically robust, I still ended up needing to survey like 100 people. With the pile sorts, 
when when friends of mine who are more ethnobotanically oriented rather than anthropologically oriented have read it, it's like, well, if you send this to an article, they're really going to want to see the numbers behind the pile sorts. But I I didn't do enough for it to be statistically robust, but there was also such consistency across the responses that resonated with what I was learning from the other lines of research that I didn't think it necessary. And so some of this comes down to um, uh, the, like, some of this comes down to like personal and disciplinary uh, comfort with what counts as evidence. And in this situation, I was like, fine. <laughs> it's sort of like, go ask people about these words and I'm pretty sure they're going to tell you what I've told you. Uh, whereas in, in certain kinds of uh, ethnobotanical journals, and, and this does seem to be a trend. I, I like plants, but I don't really identify as an ethnobotanist. I, uh, actually, I, still, I stole this from, a, from a, one of my committee members, Shannon Dottie. She says that she identifies as a social theorist who happens to dig in the dirt. And, and part of that is like, I did the archeology span because doing this project made me more interested in the history of the region. And then I did the archeology. span It wasn't that I'm necessarily committed to archeology. span So I just sort of followed the, followed the questions and was kind of why I did the ethnobotany as well. And, I, and so I'm, I'm, I'm aware of some general trends in ethnobotanical work in Africa while also not really being a member of it. And I have noticed that in a, in a lot of ethno botanical journals that in recent years, there has been more of an emphasis on being very explicit about the research methods and whether or not it's statistically robust. And ultimately what it means is that I probably just won't publish in that kind of an article. I'll publish in an article that is open to the more uh, ethnographic because there is, there is a certain quantitativeness to what I did, but I actually think that it's, it's it's numbers that are backed up with ethnographic insights that I think make the, the study convincing and compelling and interesting. So, so that was a long answer to that very straightforward question, which I think is that I think generally speaking for people who are interested in doing survey-based research, the smallest sample size is usually about 30, 30 to 35. Great, uh, thanks for that. Matthew, uh, Hope, your hand is up. Let me uh, get you, there we go. Thank you, that was a lovely talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, my name is Hope, my, my uh, name got messed up. I'm, I'm uh, at, at Leiden here with some of these oh, folks. <laughs> great, nice to uh, meet you. Yeah, thank you. I didn't, so I didn't see your talk last year. Um, I work on sign languages, specifically uh, Kenyan sign language. And um, I, had, I had a couple of questions about your, about your talk, but just I wanted to share a very short anecdote, which is just that um, when I learned Kenyan Sign Language, uh, I, you know, I learned the basics and then I, was, I thought, okay, now I'm ready to start asking about you know, deep terminology. And I started asking about animals and types of animals, birds especially, there's so many, nothing, no real, interesting lexical items for birds. So this language is only 50 years old. And, you know, I was, I actually lived there for two years. Uh, and then I came back several years later to do real actual research and discovered that there were all these words for leafy vegetables that, or signs. <laughs> and so I was really, I thought that was really curious that the, the diversity that was there to my eyes in animal pop, you know, uh -huh. animals and birds and lizards was not encoded in the lexicon yet. Yeah. You know, but uh, leafy greens were different kinds. That's fascinating. You yeah. should publish an article about that. <laughs> I'll probably just put a footnote citing you at some point. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I, I want to go back and learn more because then, of course, I don't know. I have the, the, the Luo, the, the Luo uh, word for some of them, but I don't know. So one of my quick questions, I hope it is, mm -hmm. is the Mlenda terms, how many, how many uh, vegetables are actually in that oh, yeah. category? That's a quick Great. one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have another yeah. question too. Uh, you can, I mean, you can ask the other. Oh, and, and the other question is about, um, I understand about uh, salt, where it is, and it was a beautiful description of how it's processed. 
What about the soda? I actually don't understand where, what kind of natural form that's in and, and, mm -hmm. and, and what, what about the soda part? Okay. That's my second question. Right, good questions. Uh, so with the Mlenda, you very rarely, a Mlenda will oftentimes be a mix of, of, of multiple species. Uh, it can be wild, semi-domestic, domestic, uh, if we're using those categories. Uh, you very rarely would eat an Mlenda with a single species. And from talking to people both during the pile sorts, but also when in kitchens interviewing people as they were making things, or out in fields like getting ready to go make something, there is a core of about a half a dozen species that are seen as being uh, the most common bases for a Melinda. And then you add other species to that uh, to change the flavor or the texture. And, uh, and so usually you'll have at least two, but oftentimes anywhere from three to six. And, it, and that can change over the course of the year, uh, depending on what's available, but it also changes depending on personal preference. And there are certain species that people don't like because they, they think it has too much of the, of the, um, of the stretch. Other people mm -hmm. say it doesn't have enough. So that uh, is, that was one of those things too, where I was like, I'm not gonna be able to quantify this because so much depends on availability and personal preference. What I really need to do is, is try to understand what are the, what's sort of the underlying logic behind it uh, and then think through how it plays out. So interesting question. And then of course, for people who are interested in uh, thinking uh, more specifically about specific nutritional benefits, that would obviously be a, of importance if you were to try to do that kind of a study. You'd want to know what species are being used and in what combination. Regarding the salts and the sodas, I was actually, I was actually just asking a friend about this the other day. Uh, I don't have enough of a chemistry background to really know what is the precise difference between a salt and a soda. I'm sure uh, the internet could tell me very easily. Um, but there are different words to, to refer to them, uh, and different parts of the landscape are known to produce one or the other. Yeah. And with the soda, so the soda, for example, uh, one of the local words for it is Balangida, and one of the lakes is Balangida. There's two lakes uh, <laughs> right at, on the edge of the Sanawi homeland. Uh, called Belongida, and variants of that word. And that tends to be, those are both, well, one of them especially is an ephemeral lake, very shallow and dries up for the most part uh, each year. And that is actually harvested in large uh, chunks from the surface of the ground uh, at different times of the year. Whereas the salts uh, tend to be produced from brine that's produced by passing water through sediment that is collected. One thing that, that came up is that, uh, and this, this is interesting archeologically as well, is that there's particular, although I don't, I am not able to really think about it in relation to my own archeological material, but there are particular kinds of vessels that, uh, that people would use to store water. And sometimes what people would do is instead of making a brine and boiling out the salt, people would actually just put sediment in the base of one of these vessels and then put water in it and the water would become salty. And then when you need to cook, you would just pull some of the salty water out and put it into your food rather than going through the process of making the salt. Um, and one thing that I would love to do, I know I've talked to Andrew about this, is um, uh, I, have not come, so if any of you have, I'd love to know it. I've never come across a historical study of the Amnada market network in Tanzania. And salts and sodas are a very important product that is sold at those, those markets which cycle through towns all over this part of the country. And I would love more information about how long that market circuit has been around, um, you know, how it's moved, the kinds of products that are going through it. Uh, if and how it may have been interacting with the caravan trade, uh, things like that. So I would love to know uh, more, more about that. And 
uh, like I said, it, it is really interesting archaeologically, can be difficult to study, but I think it would be, especially in this region where we have all this linguistic evidence of interaction and exchange, I think salt will, is another uh, subject that would be fascinating for folks to dig into. So um, just uh, going back to this idea about, um, about uh, this balangida word, uh, Bonnie mentions that Balangida does come from Datoga, and uh, I, uh, I just asked Sarah, actually, one of our local uh, Ihanzu researchers who's just come in for a sort of a final meeting before I move, what the word for, well, I, I knew that there was a word Kilunguda in Ihanzu, and of course that's soda in Ihanzu, and, uh, and Bonnie gives us a couple other forms, Salt Lake, Sang, Salt Pond is a Balangda, uh, soda is Gija, and then Balangidako is, is desert or refers to parts of Lake Easi to the north in uh, Adza. So it's one of these wandering, one of these wandering words, which is quite interesting. I mean, you know. Um, yeah, so um, I feel like we're we're probably, unless anybody has any other questions before we uh, before we uh, before we uh, finish. I will, uh, I will say that um, I'm hoping to hold a reading group very, very soon focused on, uh, one of the focuses on which will be, uh, will be salt. There will be one series right. of reading on salt. So uh, hopefully our uh, appetite has been wet a little bit <laughs> today. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, this talk will be, uh, will be available uh, on our YouTube channel in the coming uh, days. Uh, will also be uh, be archived. Um, so uh, I think uh, unless there are any final questions, which I can't see immediately, uh, all that remains is to um, is to thank Matthew for this really interesting uh, talk, uh, probably from a very sort of different orientation than than many uh, of us in the audience right now. And hopefully uh, we can continue to dig into some of these uh, these loose ends. As, uh, as our work continues. So thank you very much, uh, Matthew. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and thank you uh, to everybody for coming. Thank all of you. I've really enjoyed my conversations with you. And as I said at the beginning, I hope that I can participate more regularly now that I have the dissertation behind me.